So you know what is going to happen? I don't know what the general result is going to be. I don't know yet. I have been following it all through the night. All through. I did not blink. Till I'm standing here. It's sad. It's very sad. I don't know what the final outcome is going to be. But obviously, all the complaints we are making is empty noise. It's empty noise. We will continue to suffer in the hands of these people. You see them in one pocket here, but they will dictate what happens in all of our places. They're just in one pocket here. I hope you know that. But they will sit in this small pocket and they will direct what happens in just not, the whole of just not and the whole of Basa local government. They will. The local government uh, issue that we're making noise about it that the governor gave them. You think if they allow them and us, we will win? You think we will win? Do we not accuse them that they import voters from other places? Oh yeah now, go and import your own voters. Even that one, we will still share the votes. We will still share the votes. That's what we have always been doing. And they know us. <laughs> they know we will do that. They will support us to do that. I hope you know that. They will, you will think they love you, and they will sponsor you, and you will go there, and you will share votes with your brother, and will come back and sit and continue to complain. Many people don't even have voters card to start with. 1,372 ballot papers were brought here, and only one 170 ballot papers were used. Abba Jama. Okay, I think I've said enough for first service. I'll not say it again later. Because Komu Fada Zaji, Zaji, the same Wahala Tukuna. So I've said it. I think I'm, my. My heart is calm now. Well, let's come back. <laughs> Take your bulletins. <laughs> Look through the announcement section. <laughs> so for midweek worship, America will be leading us. And our focus will be revival and commitment to Christ in the youth ministry. So, youth, we are praying for revival in youth ministry now. We are praying for revival. You know, I like uh, the village pastors. This is the time, announcement, bar, that they will use and preach their sermon. And by the time sermon comes, I remember one old baba, he said, when the sermon could you so could you come he asks, he asks if you say, which message do you want to hear again? I've said it all. So you see, we are praying for revival in youth ministry. You know what that means, ba? Youth ministry is taking a nose dive. Anyway, when Emeka comes up, you will hear the rest. So we are praying that the Lord will touch the hearts of our young people to understand commitment to Christ. You've been listening to messages that are coming from Revelation chapter 2, messages to the churches. Listen very well. Item number seven, zonal fellowships. So uh, the zones concerned should take note. 
and the one we don't have is Faringada Central. Faringada Central will be meeting today, so please, uh, members of Faringada Central at the usual venue by 4 p.m. Number 11 is a new notice. The, the missions committee is planning a medical outreach for the church. So um, they will do all that it takes, but then the other part uh, that we now coming is to sign up at the missions desk, or you can call the number, especially those who will be uh, medical personnel and those who will be available for counseling. And also number 12, uh, is a reminder to parenting seminar. So it's this week. Registration will close today. Those who are interested, please connect with uh, the team. They will be outside, or you can check with the ushers. The desk will be shown you, so you can uh, register. I have a few uh, notices. We have devotionals for March and April, Every Day with Jesus and Inspiring Women. You can meet the ushering team uh, outside after the service. Our brother Andrew Ibrahim is bereaved. He lost his younger sister. She's been buried. Pray for comfort for the family. Also uh, celebrate with these two families. Uh, our brother Mundi, the wife uh, put to bed yesterday. She's been uh, on bed rest for months in the hospital. It was a challenging one. She's had uh, several miscarriages, but um, eventually the Lord has blessed them with a baby girl early hours of yesterday. So celebrate with this family over this gift. And also, Antoni Danyaya, the Lord has blessed them uh, also yesterday, they're still in Jankwanu. So uh, be in prayers for God's strength. She gave back to Caesarian that the Lord will grant strength. I'm told that we have gathered a lot of uh, eyeglasses, whether uh, medicated especially, uh, such that we're doing a bazaar today. So they will be on display outside. You can check if probably you've forgotten one before and you made a new one. You can have a spare one now. <laughs> so we'll have a, a little update from the youth ministry and after that we'll take special numbers from the choir and the band. And also to invite us to an induction that will be done. We have three of our young people that have graduated from med school and they will be inducted as medical doctors, three from seminary church. And I think, uh, I think it would be good if we will support these families. So the family of uh, uh, Dr. and Mrs. Barnabas, their son, Shola, will be inducted, and also the family of uh, the late Malta, their daughter, Miriam Malta, will be inducted, and then the family of uh, Dr. Inyang, Samantha Inyang, will be inducted. So uh, the venue is going to be at New Jude, 11 a.m. on Thursday, 3rd of March. We can make our way to New Jude and be part of this wonderful location. Thank you. Good morning, Judge. How are we doing? All right. Um, first is to say thank you to everyone in this place. Um, you've really been supportive of the youth ministry from every indication, and um, we appreciate you for having us in mind. Um, secondly, is to remind all the youths, all the youths, like I don't know how to define all the youths right now, but all the youths that fellowship have resumed, um, we meet here every Saturday by 3.55 to 6 p.m. <clears throat> it's actually a time of learning and growing together as a community. Um, we also want to implore parents to help us um, 
motivate our youth, talk to our youth, push our youth to be part of us, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to do ministry among young people. Extremely difficult for some of us that have um, been following for some years now. I think since 2019, I've been in youth ministry. And it's like as a year go by, it becomes more difficult. And part of what we are dealing with is the foreign ideologies and foreign theologies that logically the arguments make sense. But at the end of the day, you discover that it's tearing the Bible apart. So um, we want to keep growing together. We want to focus on what we believe and make sure that every member of ours understand what we believe and have a firm foundation of what we profess and not to be tossed around by every wind of doctrine, mostly those that appeal more to logical arguments than faith. So um, we are pleading with every parent to keep partnering with us just like you've done in the past to talk to your young people to be here on Saturdays and engage with our activities so that we um, can all grow together spiritually and otherwise. Um, on that note, the newly promoted teenagers from Junior Church, as well as those that promoted themselves, and um, every other person who want to know more about our youth ministry, please will implore you to stay behind for just two minutes at that extreme after the service. We just want to get your information, and we're trying to organize a class where we can um, get to know more about our youth ministry and what we do. Um, the youth ministry actually is in big need of older youth. We have literally lost all our older youth showing up, except when we invite them for some special programs. And the truth is that we need the older youth to be part of us. Sometimes you don't need to say anything. Just your humility, your activeness, your response to question could be something someone is learning from. If I'd had the time, I would have told the story of a young man who shared what he learned from an older youth so many years ago, like seven, eight years ago or thereabout, in this church. So we, you don't need to use the microphone, but there's something you are teaching as an older youth. And we are very much in need of you around because the transient nature of our youth is really a big problem for us. Before you know it, the person is going for NYC, he's got an admission, and the older youths who are supposed to be the stable people to help move things forward are nowhere to be found. So we are suffering from a kind of instability that distorts our programs as well as our plans and activities. So we are imploring the older youths to please indicate if the Lord is laying your heart to serve with us, there is enough room for service. There is room for enough hands to serve. So please... Um, Discuss with yourself and pray to God and see if he leads you. Even if he doesn't lead you, please, you can lead yourself. He will inspire you. Um, lastly, let's see on Wednesday. Thank you. Decided to take a stand, not knowing I will lose my best friend. But I would rather, I'd rather live right than in hell. Lift up my eyes, all I've got you to just stand. Oh, stand. Everybody now say you stand. Oh, oh, oh. stand for holiness. Stand for holiness. Stand for righteousness and be counted among them that shall reign with Him. Oh, 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 oh. Stand where you are alone and believe you shall receive His own. Yeah, yeah. I decided to take a stand Not believing I would lose my best friend I would rather, I'd rather live right 
Then in hell, lift up my eyes. All of God's children just stand. Oh, stand. Everybody now say, You stand. Oh, 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 oh stand, stand for holiness, for righteousness, and be counted among them that shall reign with thee. Oh, 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 stand, stand for the grace of God, stand when you are alone and believe it shall receive his hope. Stand for holiness, for oh, oh. holiness. For righteousness and be counted among them that shall reign with thee. You stand where you, you are alone and believe he shall receive his own. Stand for holiness. For righteousness and be counted among them that shall reign with thee. Stand for holiness, stand for holiness, stand for righteousness, and be counted among them that shall reign with thee. Oh, you stand, stand when you are alone, and believe he shall receive, and believe he shall receive, and believe he shall receive. He's home. And believe, and, and believe, believe he shall receive. And believe he shall receive. And believe he shall receive. He's home. Amen. Thank you very much, choir and band, for. It's very inspiring numbers. I'll read from Ephesians chapter 3 for our scripture reading. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14. Ephesians 3, 14. I'm reading from NIV, the newer translation. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is a work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayers. And what we have read, let us ask God to indeed open the eyes of our hearts and to enrich us with understanding of the deep knowledge of who we are in him and what resources he's made available to us as his children. So that we will be indeed true worshipers who will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That the Lord will help us to understand the depth of his love for us, that we will respond 
to God's love by loving him first in return and by living in holiness and in righteousness. Let's also pray and commit our state, especially with the by-elections, that we will not hear any unpleasant stories that will follow after. That the peace of God will take charge of the city of Jos. Let's also pray that as we seek revival, the Spirit of God will touch our hearts and cause such renewing in our minds and our lives as well that the witnessing power will be very, very evident in our lives. Let's also pray for the war happening in Ukraine, the Russian invasion, and all the dynamics surrounding the situation. Let's ask for the Lord's intervention. We have loved ones up there. Let's ask for God's protection of their lives. Let's ask God to bring an end to this war. There is a tendency it will escalate beyond this. Let's pray it doesn't get to that level. Let us also pray for the items we have in the bulletin, especially under the prayer focus, those whom we're praying for, for God's healing. You can also pick an item under the announcements, especially the forthcoming programs, the missions outreach, parenting seminar, zonal fellowship meetings, midweek worship service. You can pick one or two, you can pick names there, as many as you are able to, just ask for God's intervention.
Father, we thank you for answered prayers. Pray that your blessings will continue to accompany us daily. Your grace and your wisdom as well, as we serve you now and always. That your name will be glorified in our lives, even as you answer our prayers. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Thank you. How has the journey through the book of Revelation been? Okay, we are also enjoying the book of Revelations in the junior church, in the teens church. Uh, let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege to listen to your word. We pray that as you spoke to the church of that time, you will as well be pleased to make your word clear to Seminary Church today. Thank you for hearing us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we continue on Jesus' message to the churches. And today we are looking at the church in Pergamon, as you see on the, in the bulletin. So Revelations chapter 2. Revelations chapter 2. We read from verse, from verse 11 to 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamon, write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast to my name. Yet you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak, to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. The Lord bless, grant blessings on his word for us today in Jesus' name. Now, having looked at some of these churches before now, one of those things that came out clear is that Jesus walks amongst the churches. In fact, that's his first introduction to the church in Ephesus. He walks amongst the seven lampstands. And because he walks among the churches, he knows everything that groups and individuals are doing in the churches. So when he speaks to the churches, he says, I know. Not like Paul, who will say, people from close house 
wrote to me. This is the honor of the church. So he simply says, I know. Not I have heard, not it is reported. He says that because he walks amongst the churches. Did he not say where two or three are gathered in my name? I am there with them. So if where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. Then he is in the know of everything that happens in the church. This is great good news. It tells us he keeps his word. Because he is present, he does not need to be told what people are doing in his church. Neither does he assume. Because everything is plain before him with whom we have to do. Everything is plain to him with whom we have to do. Now, having considered what he said to the church in Ephesus and Smyrna in previous sermons, today we look at what he says to the church in Pergamon. Now, we have to remember that these are real churches in Asia Minor. That has been handled in previous sermons. But we are also told that they are also typical of the church of Christ through the ages. Now, some hold different views on what through the ages mean, but they are typical of the church of Christ through the ages. Uh, Pegamo, in particular, is historically was like the Las Vegas of the ancient world, or like the Dubai of today. I was wondering which one in Nigeria can we call the Las Vegas of Nigeria? Uh, okay, some people are thinking of Lagos. Maybe someone will say Port Harcourt. But that was the Pergamon of the time. It was a city built. In fact, in terms of education, it housed the second library after Alexandria in the whole world. So uh, in terms of education, you had Alexandria in Egypt, and then next was Pergamon. Now it had all the architecture was built for pleasure. Everything, in fact, we see that Jesus called the name of someone, he said, Antipas, my faithful witness, who was Killed. Pergamon housed the Roman amphitheater as well. Now, the amphitheater was sort of the first kind of uh, stadium, right? Where Romans were gathered to enjoy themselves. And part of the enjoyment was to see people butchered by animals like they so they will capture people and then give them to fight lions or wild animals and they will sit around to watch and clap. Pergamon housed one of those amphitheaters. It had so much it was the headquarters of the Roman province of ancient um, Asia Minor. So it had standard buildings. In fact, it is said that in the whole world, it had the highest collection of artworks. It had the highest collection of artworks. Some of those are now being displayed in one of the museums. 
around the world because the people, when they read the history of the place, they decided to go and dig out those works that were buried. So today, Pegamon is a UNESCO World Heritage Site simply because of the rich history and culture of the place. So, we are dealing with this kind of place where it's a melting point of ideas, right? And cultures. And Jesus simply says to the church in Pergamon, I know where you live. And then in one word, he summarizes everything where Satan has his throne. I can't think of a better summary than that. Where Satan has his throne. But for me, this is great encouragement to know that Jesus understands the situations of his church. I can only see Jesus speak to the church in, in just and say, I know where you live. Speak to the church in Miango and say, I know where you live. So he understands the situation of his church very, very well. In fact, he has the best summary to what goes on wherever we live. Perhaps because he sees more than we are capable of seeing. To the church in Pegamon, he says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Now, but we'll begin with Jesus' self introduction. And one clear thing you will notice is that to each of the churches, Jesus gives a slightly different introduction of himself. And you also find that the introduction he gives of himself allies so much with what he is going to say to the church. To this church, he introduces, him, he introduces himself as he who has the two-edged sword. Now, according to Romans chapter 13, we see that the sword is a symbol of authority. The authority both to punish and to bless. So Paul says, the leader does not bear the sword in vain. But Jesus introduces himself to the church in Pergamon, as the one who has the two-edged sword. And according to Romans chapter 13, the bearer of the sword is not supposed to bear it in vain. He is supposed to put it to use when there is need. And this is how Jesus introduces himself to the church in Pergamon. Jesus is ready to reward the church and everyone who plays any role in his church. Anyone who plays any role in his church is ready to reward. If he needs to reward with a blessing, he will reward with a blessing. But if he needs to cut with a sword, he will not drop it. This bring us to verse, brings us to verse 13. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So here is Jesus saying, having said I know where you live and describes it in the best possible words. 
where Satan has his throne. You, your church is founded in Satan's headquarters. Uh, that's quite interesting. How many of us will want to attend a church founded in Satan's headquarters? Now, it's quite interesting what Jesus says next. He does not say, I will try and take you out of this place, which is what many of us will want to see. But Jesus does not say, I will try and move you out of Satan's headquarters. Did he not say, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel? He is happy and proud that his church is found in Satan's what? Headquarters. They have the greatest opportunity to do what? To shine. Because light is needed where the darkness is thicker. So he says, I know exactly where you live, where Satan has his headquarters. But he has no plan to take them out of Satan's headquarters. His charge to them is to be faithful. So he commends their faithfulness, right? And he even mentions someone, Antipas by name, who was killed for being faithful. Now, the mention of Antipas by name, again, tells us how much Jesus knows of what goes on in his church. So Jesus is able to call by name people in seminary church and describe the role they are playing in the church here at Jets. So some of you may be doing some things and you think no one is seeing me. Jesus is seeing the role people are playing in his church. He is able to call them by name. We are two or three are gathered in my name. I'm there amongst them. See, brothers, does not the Bible say he who destroys the church of Christ, Christ will destroy him. To the church in Ephesus, Paul was speaking in Acts chapter 20 to the leaders of the church, and he said, take care of the church Christ has put in your hands. Then he describes the church. He says, the church that Christ has bought with his blood. So if you bought something with your blood, how will you take care of it? So Jesus gathers a people he has redeemed with his blood together. And he's paying very serious attention to what goes on in the congregation bought with his blood. So whatever we are doing in the church interests him. And he is taking note of everything. Those side gossips, remember we are two or three are gathered. So if you have two brothers and they are gathered and they are gossiping another brother, he is there. If you have two people gathered and they are planning and plotting against another brother in the church, Jesus is there. It's his church. He is very much in charge of his church. He does not sit back to get reports. He is not going to ask Reverend for reports. In fact, he will tell Reverend things that Reverend does not know 
about the seminary church. That's how much of the church Jesus knows. To the church in Pergamon, he introduces himself as the one having the two-edged sword. Brothers, it's good to be a part of the body of Christ. It's a privilege that comes with a responsibility. And the Equa team reminds us that he returns with the cloud. And he says, my reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. But he does not stop that. He, he does not stop there. He commends faithfulness to his name, but he also says something. Say, you did not deny my faith. Now, as well, the Bible speaks of this as the faith of Jesus. What does it mean by my faith? Jude reminds us, let us contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So the faith of Jesus here is talking about the whole system, right, of teachings and everything Jesus gave us. Jesus intends that everything he gave us be preserved as he gave us and not mixed. So there are some people in church today who believe that, some are theologians, who believe that we cannot know what Jesus taught because we are too far from that time and we cannot know what Jesus taught. So if we cannot know what Jesus taught, how sure are we that we are still Christians the way Jesus intended it? Where you hear people say, uh, you hold your position because it's a matter of interpretation. Okay, so because there are matters of interpretation, it therefore means that there is no right interpretation. Should we draw that conclusion? Well, Jesus says, you did not deny my faith. Jesus has his own faith. The faith that he himself says those who are faithful to, to him hold to. And in the days of Antipas, after Jesus had gone, people were still holding to the faith of Jesus. It was not lost. So some people who felt that the faith of Jesus was lost soon after Jesus disappeared, Jesus himself is telling us that after he disappeared, his faith was not lost. So if someone thinks that that faith cannot be found, he should look for it. He will find it. Because Jesus knows that that faith is not lost. The faith of Jesus, he says, you did not deny my faith. Remember, Paul spoke of another gospel, right? I will say, if anyone preaches another gospel apart from this one, let him be eternally cursed. There are other gospels, and holding to them is not holding to the faith of Jesus. And so it calls for self-examination as well. Which faith are you holding to? Is it the faith of Jesus? So Jesus commends the church for one, remaining faithful to his name and for holding to his faith. And he gives an example of someone, Antipas by name, who held to that faith 
even to the point of death. This moves us to verse 14. Verse 14. What Jesus has against the church in Pergamon. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also, you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Now notice, Jesus did not say you have amongst you those who teach the teachings of Bala. He says those who hold to the teaching of Bala and the Nicolaitans. Clearly then, Jesus is speaking of these people as a minority in the church, right? They are not a majority in the church. And that's why we talk today's sermon, the church in Pergamon, Jesus and the infiltrated church. Because obviously the whole church, the majority of the church is intact, faithful to Jesus. But in their midst are some who hold to wrong beliefs. So, Jesus speaks to the church and he says, I have this against you as a church. You have amongst you those who hold to wrong beliefs. Not necessarily those who teach. We, may, we can assume that if people hold to, they can teach. But that's also assuming that they have some degree of leadership, uh, leadership opportunity in the church, right? Here, it seems what Jesus has against the church relates to one, a commendation he gave to one of the churches. For one of the churches, he commends them. He says, you have tried those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have proven them to be false. And so you did not tolerate them. So for, the, for that church, Jesus commends them, right? For not tolerating this kind of people. But for this church, Jesus does not see them doing the same thing the other church did. You have these people, but you seem to be keeping quiet and ignoring them, as if it does not matter. I have this against you as a church. You know that these people are amongst you, but you seem to be turning your eyes the other way. Jesus is saying this because he knows, as he taught in the days of his flesh, that a little living does what? Living at the whole lump. And he can see this in the church. And he does not see the church leadership dealing with this as he wants it to be dealt with in his church. So he speaks to the church and tells the church, I hold this against you. I hold this against you. You are tolerating these people. But what were the wrong beliefs people held to? Where Jesus explains the teaching of Bala, but he does not explain the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Well, the teaching of Balaam here is simply, holding to the teaching of Balaam here simply means 
people in the church who believe that well, we can join with idol worshippers, uh, commit uh, sexual immorality, uh, no problems. Is that not what Balaam taught Balak to do? Notice, Jesus is not necessarily saying people who teach these teachings, but people who do what? Who hold to it. So these people say it's no problem, you can do all these things as long as you are speaking in tongues. There's no problem. You can do all these things as long as you are taking Holy Communion, no problem. All your sins are forgiven because you took Holy Communion. Brothers, we cannot do all these things and still look good in the church. And Jesus will also know that we look good. Reverend may think that we look good. Certainly not Jesus. Certainly not Jesus. Because he walks amongst us. He knows us better than Reverend does. So we may look good on the outward, but Jesus sees even to the heart. And so we may have amongst us people who because of wrong beliefs live wrongly and their lives don't tally, don't tally with the teachings of the faith of Jesus. And Jesus is saying to the church, don't turn your eyes the other way. Deal with these people amongst you. Don't pretend as if everything is all right with my church. They may be a minority, but don't ignore them. So, for the teachings of the Nicolaitans, we don't know so much about it. Obviously, it's something related to the teachings of Balaam, but it's something slightly different from the teachings of Balaam. So, I'm not able to go into that, but whatever it is, Jesus is saying, the church should not ignore people with wrong beliefs uh, whose lives are not in line with the faith he handed down to us once for all times. Jesus expects such people to be called to order by the church. And if they will not listen, Jesus expects the church to excommunicate them. And this is to say that the leadership of the church in Equa Seminary Church has difficult decisions to take. And I can, as I can see, the Reverend is ready for that. This leads us to verse 16 to 17. <laughs> Okay, I say that I thought I saw a reverend. <laughs> I saw a reverend laughing, so uh, uh, he's ready for that. So verse 16 to 17. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone 
with a new name written on the stone that no, no one knows except the one who receives it. So verse 16 to 17, what Jesus requires of the church in Pergamon. So there are two major things he requires of the church in Pergamon. The first is repentance. So as church, especially from the leadership of the church, he expects repentance on how these people in the church have been handled. Now notice one striking thing. Jesus did not speak to these people in the church. He spoke to the church. He knows that these people are in the church, but he did not speak to them. He spoke to the church. Wow. The chief shepherd is talking to the under shepherds, right? In the church. He says, I had delegated this authority. It's not that I can't do it. I can, but I had delegated this authority. If you fail, then I can come in and fight them with a sword. But it's a delegated authority. And I am counting on you to handle it. So don't fail me. So you've kept quiet on this for a while. I call on you to do what? To repent. Now Jesus is not saying repent and give your life to me. The church has already given its life to Jesus, right? But he's saying, I want to see more alignment to my way. And this is the kind of repentance we speak of, Jesus speaks of on a daily basis. Do not be transformed to the pattern of this world, but what? Do not, sorry, do not be conformed, but we be what? But be transformed. This is a daily transformation. So whenever we notice that an aspect of our lives does not align with the will of God, we are called to repentance in that area so that our lives continually align with God's way. So Jesus is not dealing here with an unrepentant church that has not given his life to him, no. He is dealing with a church that he commends as faithful but which is still work in progress, right? And he's telling the church, in this area, I need more alignment. And as Jesus looks at seminary church, he has areas to commend seminary church, but he also has areas to say, I need more alignment in these areas. So, that's the first thing he calls on the church to do, to repent and to deal, with what's, uh, to deal with what he has pointed out in their midst. Does the Bible not say judgment will begin with the church? Is that not what Jesus said? And in fact, in the book of Revelations, we see him begin judgment with the church, right? For each of the churches, he tells them, if you do this, I will do this. For some of the churches, he even say that I will come and remove the lampstand from amongst you. I will kill the church in this area. That's what he's actually saying. Because if the lampstand refers to the church and he's saying, I will remove it. That's precisely what he's saying. I will kill the church in this area. And as we look at the churches, it will become clear which churches he does that to. Notice, I will build my church and the gates of hell 
cannot prevail against it. Nothing keeps the church of Christ except Christ himself. Nothing keeps the church except Christ himself. So if he gives the church warnings and the church does not heed, he knows what to do with the church. If salt lost it, it's saltiness. It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out, to be trampled underfoot by men. Nothing keeps the church except Jesus. Then he goes on. To the next thing he requires of the church, he tells the church, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, here Jesus is speaking to individuals in the church. He who has an ear, let him hear. There are individuals in his church who are faithful, right? He has commanded them. He has told them what to do. He who has an ear, let him hear. There are individuals in his church who hold to these teachings. He has spoken to the church generally on these matters. But he who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches. This is also a reminder that Jesus, in his church, he shows no favoritism, right? He is speaking to whoever is part of his church. He who has an ear, let him hear. If an elder needs to hear, let the elder do what? Hear. If the pastor needs to hear, let the pastor hear. If the politician needs to hear, let him hear. If the rich man needs to hear, let him hear. If the poor man needs to hear, let him hear. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He is saying this because when he comes with his sword, no one will be spared. Again, in verse 16 to 17, Jesus speaks to his church of what he will do to the church. Or rather, what he will do in the church. So, he tells the church, if you do not repent, because if you repent, I will not need to come. You will handle this, and I will not need to come and handle this myself. But he is saying that because he has given the church processes, right, of handling these matters. So if the attention of the church is drawn, that a few people are living this way, then the church is expected to call them. If they will repent, the church has processes, right, to follow. If they will not repent, the church has processes to follow. And so, if the church handles them in, with those processes Jesus has given, Jesus will not need to come in. But if the church does not repent, then says Jesus, I will come to you, but I will not fight you as a church. I will fight them. <laughs> oh, Jesus and his church. Jesus does not fight his church. I will come to you. I will not fight you, the church. I will fight them in the church. 
Jesus knows how to deal with Ananias and the Sapphiras in his church. He will not destroy his church because of Ananias and Sapphira. But he will destroy the Ananias and Sapphira in his church. I will come to you and I will fight them with the sword of my mouth. So brothers and sisters, if you are here in the church and you hold this kind of teaching and you live like that, even if the church is ignoring it, please don't ignore it. Because if the church ignores it, Jesus will come, not for the church, but for you. I will encourage you, even if the church ignores it, don't ignore it. Because he will come for you. It's his church. It's not the pastor's church. So the pastor may ignore it. It's just simply because he's not a good shepherd. Under shepherd, under Jesus. But the owner of the sheep will not ignore the wolf in their midst. So the second thing, Jesus says he will do. He says to those who conquer, to those who are victorious, to those who overcome, I will give the hidden manna and a white stone with a name that only they know. Of course, this is Jesus' personal one-on-one -on -one communication of his love and affection to those who remain faithful to him. So there he is saying that there is a way I will communicate personal love to you one-on-one. -on -one. that only you will, will understand the depths of the love relationship that exists between us. So he will give you a pet name, right? That is known only between you people. What will that name be? Kai, you know, some people have two names for their wives. One name when they are happy and one name when they are sad. <laughs> and the wife likes hearing the other one, not the other one. Jesus does not have two names. He has one pet name for those who remain faithful to him. And he says he will make sure that only they know that name. But then he speaks of manna. I read and someone was saying, this is spiritual food. I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, why I don't think so is one, because Jesus said there will be eating in heaven, through of us. I will not take of this again until we meet. Will it, will it be spiritually we'll be taking it? I don't think so. He looks forward, <laughs> he looks forward for us doing it together and doing it physically. So there will be eating in heaven. In fact, where did manna come from? The Bible even talks about they ate the food of who? Of angels. So Jesus says, I will give them of the hidden manna. The other question is, where was manna hidden? Where was manna hidden? 
when the children, when he gave the children of Israel manna, he said they should get a pack some of the manna and put it in the ark of the covenant, right? And we know what he is able to do with with few bread and fish. What is he able to do with it? Uh huh. So if he had stored some manna aside somewhere in the ark, but even if he had not, even if he's not the one that was kept in the ark, where did it come from? Can't it come from there again? But he promises those who are faithful in his church, he says, I will give you of the hidden manna. Do you notice that the ark of the covenant that was on earth, when the Babylonians invaded the temple and broke it down and cutted away with things in the temple, they actually made a list of the things they took from the temple. But the Ark of the Covenant is not on that list. The understanding is because uh, Jeremiah was within the courts of the king and was shuffling between the temple and the courts at the time. So the understanding is that Jeremiah has, had hidden the Ark before the invasion because he had told the kings, this temple will be brought to ground. If you will not hear, he said, if he told the king, if you want to preserve Jerusalem and this temple, go out and submit to the king of Babylon. But if you don't go out and submit to the king of Babylon, both Jerusalem and this temple will not be spared. So, it is clear when they refused to submit, Jeremiah knew exactly what would happen, right? And Jeremiah was both a priest and a prophet. So he knew what the most important thing in the temple was. So it is clear that when the Babylonians broke in, they did not find the ark. So on the list of the things they moved from the temple, the ark is missing. Do you also remember that God had instructed Jeremiah, take money and buy a field? Hello, do you remember that instruction to Jeremiah? Take money and buy a field. The field was going to be an indication that the children of Israel will return back to their land after the exile. Do you notice that in the book of Revelation, when John says that he saw heaven open, he said in the temple in heaven he saw something. He said he saw the ark of the covenant in the temple in heaven. So the ark on earth, where is it now? We can't say where it is. But the temple in heaven has an ark. Could it be that there is some hidden manna inside that ark too? That we have to remember that when, Jesus, when Moses was making the ark and everything, well, the tabernacle, he was told, make it according to the pattern of what you had seen. Well, whatever it is, I don't believe that this is spiritual manner. But those who will be victorious, Jesus will give to it of the hidden manner. I don't know what to think. But in the 21st century, where we have so many ideas together, right? So much together. Postmodern ideas. Jesus still speaks to the church and tells the church 
that my faith is still alive. Don't buy another faith. He tells the church to remain faithful. He tells those who hold to different beliefs in his church, there is still room for repentance. He tells church leaders, address these issues amongst you. Even the church on campus can learn from this, right? Even the church on campus, different campuses can learn from this. I think we owe Jesus a lot of thanks. Just to thank him that he, he is so much in charge of his church. That he understands everything that goes on his, in his church. Just to thank him that he is there to deal with whatever is going on in his church, even if church leaders will not deal with it. We need to pray that God will open our eyes to see seminary church as he sees it. Because then we can make major adjustments, right? Let us pray. This calls for self-examination and individual repentance. Father, we ask that you will give us the boldness to say no to any teaching that is not from you and to hold fast to that which is the absolute truth that comes from you that we have learned through your word, your unchanging truth May it remain so powerful ever in our lives that we will be true witnesses. Witnesses to your love, witnesses to your victory that even in the middle of all kinds of immorality, holiness, righteousness, and purity will be our hallmark. Be merciful to us in all the areas that we have fallen short. The church belongs to you. And you know everyone that is in the church and everything that is happening. We desire that our church will be a church that is known as a church that submits to your lordship in every sense, in every way, and in everything. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.